Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Tech Haberdashery. So I'm finally done with my solid state drive testing and I'm going to show you what I got. So this video is not going to be a whole comprehensive system reviews. I've done that with Debian and Manjaro already. So we're looking at just the performance of the solid state drive in this video. I'm also doing, a, I'm going to touch on battery life just a little bit as one person in my comments said that there were several people who are having major battery life issues with their Pinebook Pros after putting in a solid state drive. So I'm going to tell you the results that I got with that. I think they're a little interesting. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to give my overall thoughts and impressions and tell you whether I think that this kind of upgrade is worth it. So let's get right into it. We're going to talk a whole lot of numbers and benchmarks. So we're going to start the benchmark results with Kden Live exports. So just so you know how I have this set up, I was using a power adapter at all times. I never had it on battery while exporting a video. The solid state drive requires a swap partition. So I left that on for both the solid state drive and the eMMC. That was an eight gigabyte swap partition, which I know is overkill, but I was trying to overkill because without a swap partition, Kden Live locks up the whole system and you eventually have to power it off. So no matter what I tried, however, I couldn't get the 1080p 60 video to export to the solid state drive. So I went through with the 1080p 30 and 720p 60, and the results are going to be for those alone. Kden Live appears to be much more CPU and memory bound than it is storage bound. I don't see the export times improving when writing to the solid state drive instead of the internal drive, except for in one test, which looks like to be an outlier. I also am including the performance results for my desktop computer. It's using a Ryzen 7 1700. I turned off hyper threading. It has eight cores at 3.6 gigahertz and 16 gigabytes of DDR4 by Corsair and it has a Corsair Force LE 480 gigabyte solid state drive. So I'm including it in here as well. I set it to render at six threads as well, just like the Pinebook Pro is set to by default, just for the sake of making sure we have the same number of threads exporting the video. These next set of benchmarks are the only benchmarks that are actually going to be true comparison graphs because I tested the internal storage already on Manjaro and Debian so it's just meant to give us a really broad ballpark idea of what the performance differences are. So I ran with FIO Bench and SQ Lite. I'll start with FIO. For FIO's read the solid state drive was 1,659 megabytes per second. That's 1,655 input output operations per second. We're going to call that IOPS going forward. The internal storage under Manjaro was 170 megabytes per second with 170 IOPS. Under Debian, it was 155 megabytes per second with 151 IOPS. The FIO write for the solid state drive under Manjaro was 996 megabytes per second, which was 992 IOPS. The internal storage was 63.3 megabytes per second and was 60 IOPS. Under Debian, the write was 103 megabytes per second with 99 IOPS. SQLite using 32 threads, exporting to the Solid state drive under Manjaro was 668.42 seconds. The internal storage was 661.58 seconds. And under Debian, it was 279.663 seconds. SQLite, again, is giving interesting results. I talked about this in my last video on the Pinebook Pro. I did some research into what SQLite is, and it's a database format. And uh, as a result of that, I'm starting to think that Manjaro has an inability to utilize all cores effectively for this test, and that's really hindering it. Or SQLite is a much more CPU-bound task and benchmark and not really disk-bound. And as such, going forward, since I'm not sure what it is, I'm not going to do any new testing with this particular benchmark. 
So the following graphs and charts that you're going to see are just references. They're not comparative as I didn't run these tests previously on the prior operating systems. For AIO stress, we got 49.04 megabytes per second. For D-Bench 128, we got 317.3 megabytes per second. The IO zone 8 gigabyte test was 178.66 megabytes per second. FS mark was 188.6 files per second. Unpacking the Linux kernel took 16.1 seconds. And Blogbench just gives an arbitrary score that's not easily attributable to anything. And the score was 1,234. I did go ahead and compare the numbers against some other results on openbenchmark.org, and this disk is about in line with where you would expect it to be in terms of performance. It's certainly faster than hard drives, and it's about even with similarly priced and spec Western Digital and Seagate drives. It's just a tad slower in comparison, but it's about the same. The FSMark and IOZone tests are the two tests which most closely resemble what I would call real-world performance when it comes to bulk data transfers. D-Bench seems a little inflated, and I think that's because it doesn't write through the Sabrent Drive's high-speed provision storage. So think of this more as a burst speed for read and write times. And what test would be complete without GNOME disks? I certainly think it's the most interesting, but it's probably the least accurate in terms of testing for real-world usage. Yes, the Sabrent rocket is most certainly fast, there's no denying it, but I can't find anything that points to real-world results. So I'd say it'd be about 951 megabytes per second fast. Not sure that that's 100% accurate, even though that's what's lower than what's advertised. That's more of a burst speed and not sustained writes. I also want to make some notes on this chart here. I was using a 39.7 Gebi byte file to transfer around. The category fastest noted speed is the fastest I saw the drive get up to. I didn't want the transfer, I didn't look at the transfer every second. I was kind of casually watching it and what the OS reported as its speed. That doesn't mean that there are not transfer points where it's actually topped out and runs faster. It certainly at times ran slower than the numbers that I'm going to show you. And the calculated average is simply the size of the archive file divided by the number of seconds. So its rate is equal to data, the amount of data, divided by time in seconds. So rate being transfer rate or transfer speed. In this testing, I think the internal storage is the only test where I believe the high-speed provisioning on the drive was ever fully saturated. The internal storage also has a more direct tr way to communicate with the solid-state drive. It's not running through a USB hub that's internal, so that's going to give you better performance. So let's look at the battery testing. I ran for the video playback I, I mimicked what I did with the Debian or and the Manjaro original reviews. I ran a 10 hour high visual change video. It's in the description. Um, I, there's no audio on the system, no system sounds. All power management is turned off. All screen dimming is turned off. When I was using it as a in the daily driver fashion where I was just going through, I was checking email and browsing websites and doing some music and audiobooks and also watching some online videos. So I mixed it all up and was kind of constantly using the system or when I wasn't using it, I would just let it sit for a while. Um, I ran it in kind of two different fashions where I was letting it sit for a while at some points and then other times I was just using it heavily until the battery died. The sleep feature under Manjaro is still not working quite right. It just powers off the screen while the system continues to operate in its active state. So whatever you're doing, it just turns off the screen and continues doing it in the background. The hibernate function doesn't work. If you have programs open and you're not doing anything on them, the computer's screen will turn off, and after a while, the whole system shuts off. When you turn it back on, you're logging in new. So any work that you were doing is gone. You have to recover it if you're using LibreOffice as a recovery feature. Web browsers can restore tabs, that kind of thing. 
but all of these numbers are close enough to the roughly six hours that I was getting prior that I don't think it's enough to be notable. I don't know what others have experienced, I don't know what they've encountered, but I use the same video testing here that I did before and got about the same results. To me, that's not significant enough to be notable. When it comes to daily use, however, using it heavily all day, it took uh, about five hours before, five hours and one minute before the battery finally died. And that was varying the screen brightness between 50% and 100% brightness. I had the power management features on, but I was doing a lot of different tasks, web browsers, multiple web browsers, Chromium and Firefox with multiple tabs open. I had heavy YouTube playback often times listening or watching a video while having another video loaded in a tab in the background things like that playing audio doing audiobooks listening to music writing that kind of thing so that took me about five hours when i was a bit easier on the system and not using really any youtube videos uh i think i, I think it was under 30 minutes i think i watched one video that was about 26 minutes i think it was a gamers nexus video that got me a little over eight hours. Eight hours, 12 minutes is what I timed that. Um, this was using the web browser a little bit more leniently. Um, not as many tabs open. Um, no background videos loading up. Editing online documents in Google Docs or Office Online for work or whatever the case may be. I was using Discord and Firefox, that kind of thing. So that was about roughly 50% screen brightness. Sometimes brighten it up, sometimes lower it down a little bit, but never maxing out the brightness and never dropping it all the way to the bottom either. So that gave me about eight hours, which is about what I experienced when I originally got the Pinebook Pro with Debian on it. And under Debian, it does seem to go to sleep properly. So I feel more comfortable with that result saying the battery life isn't affected by this solid state drive. The caveat to this may be, because I was doing a little research on it, there are some NVMe drives that are not considered to be low power. Newer NVMe drives are using a power save mode. It's a standard. And when it's not actively being used, it can theoretically reduce the drive's power consumption to down to 2 milliwatts. So I understand the concern and higher performance drives might be something worth considering or might not be worth considering <laughs> um, if you're going to do this for your Pinebook Pro. Anything that moves around electrons is, of course, going to use electricity, and moving more electrons faster means using more power. That didn't seem to be the case with this particular NVMe drive in my Pinebook Pro. So I hope that I have not uh, buried the lead on this. We've gone through all the benchmarks and the performance numbers. I'm sure there's somebody asking, well, what about boot time? How fast does it boot up now with a solid state drive? Well, it appears, at least with Manjaro, that you can't install the OS to the solid state drive. I tried, didn't work out. I did some research, found that you can kind of do a little bit of file hacking and maybe get it to work, but it looks like that that's no longer supported. Um, and I ended up blowing up my boot on <laughs> so blowing up the boot files on my uh on my install but i booted to the micro sd card and just changed the files back to the way they were before and it booted up again no problem so no harm was done permanently so thankfully the system can boot to the micro sd card and doesn't present an issue so overall is the upgrade worth it well you have to think about all the parts that go into this so you have to get the NVMe adapter. You actually have to install it. Um, that runs you about $7, and then there's going to be shipping wherever you're at in North America is, of course, going to change that price a little bit, uh, including taxes and so forth. Um, if you're other places in the world, obviously it's going to be more than $7 US, give or take whatever your shipping and import costs are. So there's that, at least $7 for that. I got my solid state drive off of Amazon for $50, 256 gigabyte drive. Uh, so all said and done, taxes and everything, it came out a little under $75. So we're going to say $75 for very fast 256 gigabyte of storage to add to the system. 
Unfortunately, it's really just storage. There's not any advantage to boot times. Um, the programs I tested didn't really give any appreciable performance difference. You can, of course, install your apps and your programs to the solid state drive, and you'll see a performance increase when launching the programs, but it's not enough to me to be worth it. I think if I were going to do this again, I would go with a 128 gigabyte drive, and so maybe cut the cost down to around $50 or so. I mean, at $75, you're almost half the cost of the Pinebook Pro. So I just, I don't think that in my use case, is this not being my primary device, it's worth it. If this is going to be your primary device, if you're going to store all of your pictures and your videos on it, I can't give you a dollar amount that's valued on that. I mean, you can go all out and pay $100 for a one terabyte drive and then you'll, <laughs> yeah, use it as your main computer, do it that way, you know. Um, but for for um, for me, that just wasn't worth it. So anyway, sorry I studied a little bit there at the end. Um, thank you for watching. Leave any questions, comments, or concerns in the comment section, and I will do my best to address them. So thank you again for watching, and have a good one. Bye now.